Welcome to Village Church of Lincolnshire. We're so happy you could join us this morning for a very special Sunday. Um, we are very, very excited that today is the installation service for our new senior pastor, Jim Ranke. Happy to see some of Jim over there. And... Um, we are really thankful for how the Lord has led the Rankies here and led the search committee in the process of uh, determining that they would be um, our next pastor couple, and we are very, very thankful. Uh, a couple of announcements today to draw your attention to in the bulletin. One thing, uh, we're forming a Christmas choir again this year. We're very excited about that. And if you'd like to be part of that, please contact Jane Niederbrock if you would like to join in. She's looking for more singers, and she'd love to, to talk to you about that. So if you're interested in participating, and you know, if there's not enough people, I might have to do it, and you don't want that. So please, please reach out to Jane uh, to avoid that catastrophe. Um, other announcements that I'd uh, like to just mention today is that we had our first lesson in our new series uh, called Holy Sexuality in Hour in the Word. It was a really uh, good time of discussion. It's a series on a, a Christian vision of sexuality, what it means to um, think about the topic of sexuality from a Christian and biblical perspective. So we'd really encourage you to join us for that at 9 a.m. next week. And if you can't join us for that, what, what you can do is uh, we're, we're starting a podcast where we post the recording of those sessions online for you to listen to while, you know, maybe while you're working out or while you're driving to work or, you know, any time you might listen to a podcast, uh, you'll be able to find it. It's going to be called Hour in the Word Podcast. Um, more details can be found in your bulletin about that. Well, uh, I believe that is the main announcements for today. We've got an exciting Sunday planned. Lots of um, unique things going on today, so uh, stay with us, and let's pray as we get started this morning. Lord, uh, I'm reminded of this passage from your word that uh, was read to me recently, that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And we are thankful this morning as we reflect on the season that has come here at Village Church. We are thankful that you have led us so well, um, that you have equipped Pastor Kenny uh, to lead this congregation well. And we are thankful this morning as we look to the season to come. And this morning as we worship you, Father, we pray that you would enliven our hearts as we welcome Jim and Chris Rinke. Lord, as we get ready for the next season of Village Church of Lincolnshire, would you fill our hearts with hope, Lord, hope at what you are doing in this people. Would you fill our hearts with faith as we look to you as the God who always keeps his promises? And would you fill our hearts with love as we seek to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves? Join us now in worship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as you are able. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 100. Please join me in a responsive reading. Make a joyful noise, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Please join us in singing. Come, patient, join to sing. Hallelujah, amen. Loud praise to Christ our King. Hallelujah. Oh, 
The Old Testament reading is Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord as recorded in the book of Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Well, hi. <laughs> it is a joy to be here with you. And one of the first things we get to do, if you haven't met her, this is my wife, Chris. One of the first things we get to do is spend some time with the kids. So if all children, we're going to say fifth grade and under, if you would come and join us up here, that would be great. All kids fifth grade and under. Hi. Well, you guys snuck up behind me. How are you? Can you guys come down here just a little bit by us? Come a little closer, okay? Anyone else want to come? That it? All right. Good. Good group. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. All right. Well, do you know who we are? No. I know, right? These new people talking to you today. Well, I'm Pastor Jim, and this is Chris. And we're the Rinkies. That's our last name. The Rankies, okay? So you could just say Pastor Jim and Chris. We would know you're talking to us, okay? So. So do you know what a pastor is? Yes. What's a pastor? What do they do? He works for the church. Good. Anybody else? What do pastors do? Preach. They preach. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Do you know what else they do? Most people don't know what else they do. <laughs> they, they, read a lot. they read a lot. That's right. They read a lot. They study and they preach and they listen to people and they care for people when they're sad or when, they're, when they have needs or they have questions. Pastors help. And then pastors also kind of help organize things at the church to make sure we can do things together. So that's what pastors do. So in the Bible, it also talks about what pastors do. Do you guys have a Bible at home? Or mom and dad have a Bible at home? So in Ephesians verses, chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, it says, It was Christ who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for the works of service. And that's what pastors do. Pastors work in the church to help us all grow in our faith so we can follow Jesus together. So that's what pastors do. So we can serve together, so we can learn together and grow together following Jesus. Now, one thing I want to tell you, though, the word pastor is kind of different, a kind of different word, isn't it? It, it, it's hard to know, but it, it, it also means shepherd. So a pastor 
is like a shepherd. Do you know what a shepherd is? What do, do they do? What does a shepherd do? Take care of sheep. Get Takes shot. care of the sheep. That's right. That's exactly right. The shepherd feeds the flock and cares for the flock and guides the flock of sheep and, and, and protects them from dangers out in the world. So shepherds care for the sheep, don't they? And that's what pastors do. Pastors are like the shepherd of the church. But you know what? We have a better shepherd, a better shepherd than even the pastor of a church, a chief shepherd. And in the Bible, in Psalm 23, 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Jesus is our perfect shepherd, isn't he? So my job as pastor will be to help, help guide the people here, help you grow in your faith, but... We're all together following the chief shepherd. And who's the chief shepherd? God is, right? Jesus is our chief shepherd. And he helps us, uh, takes care of us, and helps us to follow him. So we're, that's our job, is to follow him together, right? As our shepherd. Now, after we pray, I'm going to pray just for a short moment. I'm going to ask God to help us follow Jesus together, okay? Because that's what we're here for now. We're going to live here and help us follow Jesus together. So we're going to pray. And after we pray, we have something to help you remember that we're all the sheep and he's the shepherd, okay? Let's pray together. Can you guys fold your hands and close your eyes? And we're going to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are our shepherd, that you are perfect and you are true and you are good, and you are powerful, and you take care of us and lead us. Help us to follow you together, and help uh, me to be a good pastor and a good shepherd for all your sheep here at Village Church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Remember who he is? Who am I? Pastor, Pastor Jim. Jim. That's what, right. Do you remember my name? Chris. Chris. Good That's job. Right. Now he's the pastor of the church and the shepherd, and you guys are part of the church, right? That means that he's here and I'm here for you. What? It I is. Know. You're moving, aren't Very you? Sad. And you're gonna be you're gonna be God's sheep in a new church, huh? And your dad's gonna be the pastor right good yeah okay so i'm gonna give you all a sheep so you can remember that jesus is your shepherd and he watches over you and takes care of you all the time okay so if you want to come over to me i'll give you a couple sheep and you can go back thanks for coming up Our scripture is entitled, I am the Good Shepherd, going on with the theme of this morning. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper, opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech 
Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. You too. It is now time in our service to receive our tithes and offerings to the work of the Lord here at BCL. And we have um, a double hymn, if you will, today for offertory. First, we will be blessed by Don Hedges at the piano, and then I will ask you all to stand and join us as we sing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. <laughs>
think you've done. Please stand with us. Please join me in prayer this morning. Lord, as we come before you, we want to take a moment to thank you for the loving care that you have shown to BCL over the past year and a half. Like the good shepherd that you are, you have led and guided us through so many things. Over the past months, we've said goodbye to Pastor Lee, who served you faithfully here for over 20 years. We've said goodbye to friends and family if they moved out of this area. We've lost loved ones to sickness and death. We've navigated political instability, the global COVID pandemic, and a pastoral search. And yet, through it all, you have always been with us, 
your rod and staff guiding us in every situation. As you, have, as you have led us over the past year, I pray that you will remain with us as we move into a new season here at VCL. We pray that you would be with those in the congregation who are struggling through illness, the loss of work or income, changes to life situations, or any number of issues about which we may or may not be aware. Help us to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear those who are in need of your love and grace within our midst. Let us reach out to them and love them as you have commanded. And I pray that you would work in their lives and give them a deep and abiding sense of your presence, comfort, and peace. Though they are traveling through their own valley of the shadow of death, remind them that you are with them. We pray a special prayer for the Swingles this morning and their ministry in the Middle East. Lord, we know they serve in an area that is hostile to your word and that continually experiences unrest. Even as they live and minister surrounded by enemies of the gospel, I pray that you would prepare the hearts and minds of those around them. Let them be a shining light for you that draws those who come in contact with them to your salvation. As we turn towards the sermon, I want to thank you for Pastor Kenny and all that he has done for us during this interim period. While we always remember that you are a great shepherd, we thank you for the work of this faithful under-shepherd on our behalf. He's faithfully preached your word and ministered to your people here, giving of himself and always encouraging us to look towards your word for wisdom. As he prepares to move on to a new congregation, I pray that you would prepare the way for them, that their transition would be smooth, and that they would be welcomed and loved by their new flock. And as, he is, and as he and his family minister there, remind him daily that of all the many tasks he will perform, he is first and foremost your under-shepherd in that place. While none of us can claim to know exactly what the future holds, for now it seems that this will be the final time Pastor Kenny addresses your congregation here at VCL. And so, as we have prayed before, we again ask that the words he speaks this morning would be your own. Prepare our own hearts as we listen. Let what is from you sink into our minds and hearts, and let all else fade away, so that we will be enriched, convicted, and built up by your words to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and to the glory of the Father. Amen. Well, thank you, Brian. Oh, my on? All right. Thank you, Brian. Oh, that was all I could do to even choke out a few words while we were singing. So for those of you who are not accustomed to seeing me get emotional, strap in, because the next 30 minutes are going to get awkward. <laughs> no, we'll be all right. So this is the shepherd's crook. It's not the same shepherd's crook y'all handed me last week. This is the one that Lee handed me in January of last year. And today, I get to pass it on to Jim, but not without getting in one last word. <laughs> so back in, if you couldn't tell, our theme today is shepherding, right? So back in 2015, uh, Suzanne and I went to Ireland, and we were in a place called Killarney, and we heard from everyone that you just, you just have to go and see this sheepdog demonstration. It's, it's like the coolest thing you'll see in Ireland. You got to do it. So we did it. We got on a tour bus, and, and, and we made our way to this long, sloping pasture land on, on the side of a hill. It's a couple acres fenced in, and this shepherd comes walking into the pasture land, all scruffy looking, and he's got two little sheepdogs with him. I think they were healers, but I don't remember exactly. And what he proceeded to do for 15 minutes is to just put the dogs through the paces, and he would use them to move the sheep from this place to that place to that place. He'd use the sheep to cull the herd. It, it, was, it was amazing. And the most amazing part of it for me was that he didn't move, the shepherd. He stood in one spot, and all he did was whistle. He had this elaborate system of whistles that told the dogs where they needed to go and what they needed to do. I learned how to whistle so that I could do something like that with my kids. <laughs> I'll let you know when it starts working. I'm not kidding. I'm tempted to try right now. <laughs> now that image, that image of a shepherd standing in one place and, and, and whistling, 
and sending out the sheepdogs to go and direct the sheep. That's one vision of pastoral ministry, isn't it? You've got the chief shepherding executive, as it were, uh, in his office that smells of rich mahogany surrounded by many leather-bound books, and he whistles from his office, and the dogs, the sheep dogs, that is the elders and the staff, sorry Brian, sorry Casey, <laughs> he whistles and they go and they direct the sheep. And this model of ministry, this vision of pastoring is actually quite popular in America, and it's often very effective. It yields churches of great size and great circumstance. But is it really the right image? Is that really what a shepherd does in God's flock? Now, today is a special day because we will install a new shepherd here. In just a little while, I will take this crook and I will hand it to Jim, and he will become VCL's new senior pastor. But before we do that, I want us to spend just a little time in God's word thinking about just what it is that we are calling Jim to do. Are we calling him to whistle, to sit in his office and to send out the sheepdogs? Is that what a pastor does? Or are we calling him to a work that is so much harder, yet so much more beautiful and beneficial to you? So I invite you now to open your Bibles. We're going to be looking at John 21, verses 15 through 19. And the passage we're about to read is, it's been variously referred to as Peter's commission, or his installation as a shepherd of God's flock. And really, it is a prototype for what we're doing here today. Now, before we dive into the text, I just want to remind you a little bit about who this Peter guy is. We first met him in John 1 when his brother Andrew brought him to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is the Aramaic word for rock, or if you translate it into Greek, Peter. Now, like a rock, Peter's devotion was solid, but also like a rock, he could be a little dense. When Jesus told his disciples that he would have to die, what did Peter do? No way, Jesus. And what did Jesus have to say? Get behind me, Satan. He had to rebuke him because he didn't understand. What Peter thought that Jesus needed him to do was to follow him into war. And when Jesus told him in John 13 that where he was going, Peter could not follow, Peter was upset. He said, Lord, why can't I follow? I will lay down my life for you. And do you remember Jesus' response? Will you? Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And if you know the story, then you know that that is what eventually happens. Jesus is arrested, and even though Peter takes up his sword and swings it once or twice, he ends up slinking back into the shadows. And when Jesus is hauled into the high priest's courtyard, instead of standing by his friend, Peter stands by a charcoal fire, and he warms himself beside the very people who arrested Jesus. And that's where it happens. Not once, not twice, but thrice. He denies his Lord. Now, a lot of stuff happens between the denial and today's story. Jesus is crucified, he's buried, he's resurrected, he appears two times to his disciples, but we don't really see him interact with Peter until this third and final post-resurrection uh, appearance. In the first 14 verses that lead up to our passage today, they set that scene. The disciples go fishing, they see this mysterious figure on the shore, and he tells them, hey, put in your nets over there. And the nets pull up so much fish, they, they, can't even, they can barely even drag it back to shore. And Peter, right away, he notices that it's Jesus, and he jumps out of the boat, and he swims right to him while the disciples pull the boat to shore. And when they get there, what do they find? They find breakfast served by a charcoal fire, very much like the one that warmed Peter on the night when he denied his Lord. And when breakfast was done, Jesus sat Peter down for a little chat by that fire. And what we're going to read is that chat. So again, this is John 21, verses 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Father, we do thank you for your word. We confess that it is a light shining in a dark place. And we humbly ask you now that you would send your Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds so that we might comprehend the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of what you have done for us in Christ. And it is in his name that we pray now. Amen. So there's more in this story that we could possibly hope to cover in 20 hours let alone 20 minutes. So we're just going to cut to the chase. And we're going to focus on three specific things that this passage tells us about what it means to be a pastor. And to, to, to help us along, we can think about this in terms of the beginning, middle, and end of pastoral ministry. Beginning, middle, and end. So let's begin with the middle. No, let's begin with the beginning. I'm not losing it. So the conversation we just read begins with a personal address. Simon, son of John. In fact, Jesus repeats that personal address two times in this passage. And I don't want you to miss that, because there's only one other place in the Bible where Jesus addresses Peter in this way. It's in John 1, when they first meet. So in a very subtle way, Jesus is kind of bringing Peter's mind back there, back to the beginning of their relationship. It's as if he's looking back over the whole course of the three years that they've spent together and compressing that entire history into one pregnant moment by the charcoal fire, Jesus asks him a question. Do you love me? But that's not the whole question, is it? Because Jesus doesn't just ask, do you love me? He asks, do you love me more than these? Talking about the disciples. Now, it's really easy to misread this and to think that Jesus wants to know if Peter loves him more than he loves his friends, as if he's testing Peter to, to discern the intensity of his love. But that's actually not what Jesus is asking. He's asking Peter if Peter loves him more than the disciples love him. That's the question. It's a question of comparison. You see, before Jesus' death, Peter was always the leader. He was always the guy out front, for good or for ill. You might recall when Jesus took the disciples up on the Mount of Olives after the Lord's Supper and before he was arrested in Matthew 26, and he said to him, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Peter, hard-headed Peter, he piped up right away and he said, though they fall away because of you, I will never fall away. These jokers might go running, but I will stand firm for you, Jesus. That's what he's saying. It's a little cocky, right? Maybe a little awkward. Like, I wonder what James or John or Simon the Zealot happened to think about that when Peter said it. But what did Peter do? Did he stay true to his word? Did he stand firm and strong? No. They struck the shepherd, and he scattered. So here we are by the charcoal fire, and Jesus asks him, Do you love me more than these? And Peter says, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He could have said, Yes, I love you more than they do. Or, Yes, Lord, you know I'm your best and biggest follower. But that wouldn't have been true, would it? And at any rate, that's not what was important right now. 
So Peter left it at, I love you. It's as if Jesus was giving Peter a test. Or if he was, as if he was laying a trap to test Peter's heart, to see if and how he changed. And the apostle, he passed the test. He steered clear of the trap. And we know this is the case because the next two times Jesus asks him, do you love me? He leaves off that bit about the disciples. Now, how did Peter get here? How did Peter get to the place where it was no longer about how much he loved Jesus more than everybody else, and it was just about him and the Lord? How much he loved Jesus, full stop, period. He was humbled. That's how he got here. In his failure and in his denial, Peter was made to face the fact that he was not as solid as he thought he was. And he realized that what he needed most was not to serve Jesus, but to be served by him. And folks, that is the beginning of pastoral ministry. When we call a pastor and we put him behind this pulpit, we literally put him on a pedestal. He's got the training. He's got the experience. He's got the skills. He's got the wisdom. He can lead us where we need to go. We will pay him to love Jesus more than we do. And he will get up there and he will show us how it's done. But for those of us who are called to shepherd God's flock, we can never start like Peter on the Mount of Olives, full of ourselves and sure of what we have to offer. No, we start like Peter by the charcoal fire, humbled to the point of emptiness, where all we have to hold on to is not our skill, not our resume, not our training, not our pedigree, but all we have to hold on to is the love of Christ. And it's in that place, in our humble emptiness, that he calls us to feed his sheep and to tend them and to care for them. I say that to myself, and I say it to Jim and to Casey and to Brian and to Carl, and to, to, to Jim the second now, apparently, and all the other elders. I say it to you guys because we have to start from the knowledge that apart from God's grace, we are unfit for the task of shepherding. And without his help, the best that we have to offer, no matter our training or experience, without God's help and his grace, the best we have to offer you is a pile of filthy rags. And I say this not to Jim and Casey and the elders, but I say it to the church as well, because this is what you should expect of your pastor. Not that he would be the pinnacle of spiritual confidence or a never-ending source of religious insight, or that he would be a brilliant leader or this larger-than-life figure. But what you should expect is that he would humble himself before the Lord, that he would make Jesus the utmost object of his devotion and that he would minister to you out of the fullness that Jesus provides and not out of his own. Jim is a great guy. I like him. But at the end of the day, you don't want Jim. You don't want me. You don't want Casey. You want Jesus. And it's when you expect someone or something else in a pastor that you place a burden on that pastor's shoulders that he cannot bear. And you create an expectation that he will never be able to fulfill. Now let's talk about those expectations. What is a pastor supposed to do? What's the job description? That brings us to the middle of pastoral ministry. Three times Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. And three times Peter answers in the affirmative. And each time Jesus responds with a command. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. These phrases all differ, mostly for stylistic reasons, but they ultimately point to one thing. A shepherd's job is to feed and tend God's flock. Now there's a beautiful simplicity in that, isn't there? When I wrote up the job description for the senior pastor position, it clocked in at 370 words. I checked. But here we have nine, and three of them are repeats. It's a beautiful simplicity. 
That the, Jeff, the, the shepherd's job is to feed and to tend. It's not easy, but it's simple. Now, what does it look like? First, it looks like feeding. Profound, right? And, of course, that can refer to, you know, hospitality and works of service, inviting you out for meals, tending to the poor and the needy and all that. Absolutely. But remember what Jesus said when he was tempted in the desert in Matthew 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The shepherd, Pastor Lee used to say, is a word worker. This Bible is our stock in trade. It's the thing you pay us to do before anything else is to handle this word, to study it, to soak in it, to mine its depths so that we can bring up its treasures and share them with the people of God and teach you how to go in and mine them for yourselves. So before anything, you are calling Jim here to lead you into a deeper understanding and appreciation of the word, to, to become a student of its inexhaustible wisdom and to train you all to know the mind of God as it is revealed for you in scripture. That's what you're calling him to do. And that's what it means for the shepherd to feed. But it, Jesus also tells Peter to tend, feed and tend. And tending the sheep is about caring for them and protecting them leading them toward greener pastures, watching for danger along the path, and sometimes hooking them with your staff to pull them out of a hole. As you can imagine, that is a hard and holy task. It requires a shepherd to know his people, and it requires that people to allow themselves to be known by him, to trust God that he has called this man to tend to their spiritual needs and to submit themselves to his oversight and care. That's why the writer of Hebrews makes it a point to tell the people in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. My joy as a pastor is to see the word of God come alive in your minds and hearts and to see you walk in the mercy and the love and the grace and the wisdom of God. That is my joy. And my burden, any pastor's burden, is to see one of his sheep wandering off toward danger and to have that sheep resist every effort to help him or her and to guide that sheep to safety. Brothers and sisters, you are now calling Jim to feed and to tend this flock, along with Casey and the elders. Let them all do this with joy and not with groaning. Trust these shepherds. Trust their gifts and graces. Let them lead you into God's green pastures. Let them keep watch over your souls. Don't make it a burden. Make it a joy. Now we come to the end of pastoral ministry. You may have noticed in verse 17 that Peter gets a little exasperated when Jesus asks him for the third time, do you love me? The text says that he was grieved. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And I don't think Peter is being disrespectful. I don't think he is annoyed. I think he is grieved because Jesus had to ask him three times. And that repetition can't help but remind him of the three times that he denied his Lord. But it's in the repetition that Jesus does not poke at the nerve, but he heals it. He shows his love. He shows his restoration. Because after this final exchange, he gives him the command and he moves on. There is no greater display of love required from Peter. There are no acts of contrition for Peter to perform. His threefold love is more than enough to cancel out his threefold denial. So now it's time to restore him to ministry. But here's the ironic part. Now that he's been forgiven, 
Now that he's been restored, Jesus, as it were, brings him back to the Mount of Olives, back to that moment when he said, I will lay down my life for you. And in verses 18, 18 through 19, he tells him that that is precisely what he's going to do. The day is coming when Peter's youth will fade and he'll become an old man. But he won't be the kind of old man who has a fat IRA and gets to relax and order drinks and do whatever he wants whenever he wants. He'll be the kind of old man who needs to be taken care of, who needs to be dressed, who needs to be fed, who needs to submit his freedom to the wishes and will of other people. And this, John breaks in to say, is where Peter's journey in ministry will end, in his death, at the hands of others. I once heard my favorite preacher, Alistair Begg, talk about ministry. And he shared this quote from the greatest preacher you've never heard of, Bruce Thielman. There is no special honor in preaching. There is only special pain. The pulpit calls those anointed to it as the sea calls its sailors. And like the sea, it batters and bruises and does not rest. To preach, to really preach, is to die naked a little at a time and to know each time you do it that you must do it again. It's what it feels like to preach. When a pastor opens up his Bible and enters into God's presence, he he's forced to deal with the darkness inside his own heart. And then he's got to take that out of the study and bring it up here. And he's got to shed the robes of self-righteousness and religious pretense so that he can bless the people of God with the fruit of his struggle with God and his word. None of that is easy. It leaves you battered and bruised, dying naked a little at a time. And this doesn't just apply to that. It doesn't just apply to what happens in the study or in the pulpit. It applies to all of ministry. We are constantly wrestling with God and man. And every day brings a new opportunity for the pastor to lay down his life. How's that for a seminary poster, right? Come to Ted's and prepare to die. That'll only be $10,000, thank you, this semester. <laughs> but here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. On the other side of death, there is life. And the pastor's call to die isn't all that dissimilar from what Jesus tells us all in Matthew 16, 24 through 25. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Look, I hope y'all don't actually kill Jim. I, I meant it. I like you. I don't want them to kill you. But you need to know that in calling him to be your pastor, you're bidding him to come and die for you a little bit at a time. And in doing that, to lead you all in dying to yourselves so that you might live to Christ. And here's what he needs from you in order to do that well. He's going to need your prayers, your patience, your encouragement, your support in every sense of that word. And most of all, he's going to need your love. Love is the driver here, isn't it? Ministry begins with the love of Christ. First and foremost, the infinite love that he showed us in pouring out his life for us on the cross. But secondarily, in response, the love that we show and extend on the basis of the great love with which he loved us. And the middle of pastoral ministry is the sharing of that love, the extension of that love for the flock, for the people that God has given us to tend and to feed. And the end of pastoral ministry is our reflecting the cruciform nature of Christ's love by dying to ourselves to care for others. 
This was the vision of pastoral ministry that Jesus held out to Peter. Not just here by the charcoal fire, but throughout their entirely earthly walk together. He showed them that this is what pastoral ministry is about. And this is the vision that he's holding out to Jim right now. As he takes up the charge to shepherd this flock. And the fuse that will fire that charge comes in the fourth and final command that Jesus gives to Peter. Right at the end of this passage. Follow me. You couldn't follow me before, Peter. You were too full of yourself. But now you can. Now you can follow me where I've gone. And you can lay down your life. I've told you what you need to do. Now follow me. I've told you how hard it's going to be. Now follow me. I've shown you what it looks like to feed and to tend God's lambs. I've shown you what it's going to take. Now follow me. May this be the watchword for your ministry at VCL, Jim. Follow Christ wherever he leads. And may it be a watchword for all of you as well. As the New Testament so often encourages us and admonishes us, follow your shepherd as he follows the good shepherd. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you that you did not send hired hands to care for us, but you sent your only begotten son who laid his life down for the sheep. And we rejoice in the great love that he has shown us. And we pray now, Father, for Jim as he enters into this work. Would you show him what it looks like to follow Jesus and to lead like Jesus? And pray for this church, Lord, that they would flourish under his ministry, not because of anything in him, Lord, but because of everything in you. Not because of anything he has done, is doing, or will do, but because of what you have done for us in Christ. Feed this church by his hand, Lord. Tend it, care for it, and lead your sheep into their greener, heavenly pastures. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to invite Jim and Chris to come up now, along with the elders. And we're going to do a little commissioning or installation. And how this is going to go is I'm going to read some questions to Jim. Questions about his calling, questions about his commitment and his willingness to take up this charge. And I'm going to read some questions to you as well in receiving him. And then we're going to pray. Does that sound like a plan? You like that? Yeah, good. Thank you. All right, Jim and Chris, come on over. Jim, are you now willing to take charge of this congregation as their pastor? I am. Do you conscientiously believe and declare, as far as you know your own heart, that in taking upon you this charge, you are influenced by a sincere desire to promote the glory of God and the good of the church? I do. Do you solemnly promise that by the assistance of God's grace, you will endeavor faithfully to discharge all the duties of a pastor to this congregation and will be careful to maintain a deportment in all respects becoming a minister of the gospel of Christ? I do. Now I ask you, do you, the people of VCL, profess your readiness to receive Jim Reiki as your senior pastor? Do. do you promise to receive the word of truth from his mouth with meekness and love and to submit to him along with the elders in the exercise of oversight and discipline? We do. do you promise to encourage and pray for him in his labors and to assist his endeavors for your instruction and spiritual edification? We do. 
Do you agree to support and maintain him and to furnish him with whatever you may see needful for the honor of religion and for his comfort among you? We do. Let's pray. You got a microphone? For this, we will grab these. Oh, we're going to be kind to you and bring some chairs in. Let's pray together. Holy Father, in this solemn moment, we lift up Jim and Chris to you. In the laying on of hands of elders, we commission them together for the work of ministry. Lord, we acknowledge your work in calling Jim to be a shepherd. Lord, that when he speaks to you in love, you respond to him, feed my lambs. We pray now, Lord, that you would equip him to feed this congregation, to tend and care for it forever by the word. Lord, that you would equip him in that work of studying your word well, that he would be forever a student of the word of God. Lord, we pray that you would equip us as a congregation to always and ever stick close to that word and to receive the message that we hear from Jim in it with joyful hearts. Lord, would you equip them as they shepherd us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the calling process that as you made it clear to the search committee and then to the congregation that you had your hand on Jim and Chris leading them in this way. And Father, we thank you also for all the experiences of their lives their previous ministries, all the challenges they faced, all the ways you've seen, they've seen you work in their lives, in the lives of other people. We thank you for that. And we know that you have prepared them by all these experiences to serve your people here. So we ask that as you now give them this charge, that you would bring all those things into their remembrance to serve your people. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we praise you so much for bringing Jim and Chris here to BCL. We pray that during these next months of transition that you would smooth the path for them. I pray that they would feel the love of the congregation for them, that they would be welcomed and accepted here, that even as we look to them, him as the next shepherd and guide for the church, that they would also be accepted as friend and companion here. We pray that in all the aspects of their, their move here, that you would be with that process, that things would go smoothly. We praise you that they've already found a house in the area. Lord, we pray that with this installation, you would be powerfully with Jim, that you would continually fill him with your spirit as he leads BCL and as he and all of us reach out to the Lincolnshire community, that it would be clear that you are among us, that you are with him, and that we are your people. Father, thank you for bringing Pastor Jim to our church. Thank you for giving him so many gifts to serve your people. We pray that uh, you give him strength and help him preach your word faithfully, that he's a good shepherd for our people and a good leader in the community. We pray that you give him physical and mental strength to do your work. And we pray that you protect the unity in our church as we protect Jim and we support him in his work. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you <clears throat> for bringing uh, Jim and, and Chris to our congregation. We thank you for the life experiences that you have given to this couple to prepare them for this day. We assure them that 
ministry here at BCL is a team concept and that we are eager and willing to serve alongside him and just guide and direct uh, the ministry here. Thank you for his life. Thank you for their family. We pray for them as they make this move. A move is not always easy. And we just uplift them uh, as they face the challenges in the coming days. And we welcome them to VCL. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Father, we thank you for Chris. We know that um, a pastor is nothing without his faithful co-laborer. So I thank you for all the ways in which he has worked behind the scenes, all the ways in which he has supported Jim, all the ways in which he has done ministry right alongside him. I pray especially for her now, Lord, as they come into this flock, as they come into this new place. Help her to connect, to make friends, to build new relationships, to figure out a new routine and a new rhythm. We pray that, of course, for both of them, Father. And I pray that in the coming weeks and month, they would settle here and that they would find a true home and that they would learn to truly love these people. And these people would learn to truly love them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to invite you two to stand, and Brian is going to read you a charge from Scripture. We'll go ahead and move these out of the way. There you go. So with the same charge that we sent Kenny off with last week, I read to you from 2 Timothy 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. All right, VCL, I now present to you your new senior pastor, Jim Ranke. Now I'm going to let him talk. What a joy. Thank you to the elders and to Kenny and to all who have put a lot of effort into today and into the whole process that got us to today. So thank you to everyone. I, I want you to know that... Um, we have our, our biggest desire in this whole process has been to discern, Lord, is this what you're doing? And if you show us it's what you're doing, we want to do it with you. And with the help of the search committee and prayer and talking to people I respect and I love and who know me deeply, we determined this is what God is doing. And so we're here with that confidence that God has brought us to this point. He's brought you and he's brought us to this place together today. And with that, I want you to know that uh, Chris and I today eagerly come to give ourselves to you 
to serve you and to serve with you, to love you and to love with you. And so we're committed to that. As a pastor, I want you to know, I will seek to live an abiding life in Christ. And I will love him. And I will give everything I have to be obedient to his call. I want you to know that I will seek to center my life and ministry here on God's word. It is what I trust. It's what I lean on. Without it, we cannot hear the Spirit of God. And so know that I will make it the center of what I do here. I want you to know that I will seek to use the gifts and opportunities God has given me for his glory and for your good. I don't have every gift. But what I have, I offer. And I will offer it in faithfulness to our Lord because I know he will use what he has given us for his glory. I want you to know that I will seek to live my life paying close attention to my life, to the, the parts of my life, the way I live my life, and to doctrine. I will hold true to the truths of Scripture, and I will seek with all I have to live by them. I will seek to live with you in transparency. I will be vulnerable. I will do my best to be open, to show you my struggles, to show you my journey. So that over time, maybe the next 20, 25 years, you will see my progress. My hope is that five years from now, you see a different man standing in front of you. A man who is closer to Jesus than he used to be. A man who is more faithful than what he has been. I want you to see my progress. So I thank God and I thank you for the opportunity we have now to grow together for the glory of God, to be a shining light, to be an outpost of the kingdom of God in this community that others might see that we have a God of love, a God of grace, a God who invites us into deep fellowship with him. That's my promise to you. Thank you for calling me as your pastor. We're going to share in communion, and I think this is the greatest thing to do together. I want you to know that when I served as regional minister, I, I often shared, people asked, what did you miss most about being a pastor? And I said, what I really missed, I think most, has been serving communion. It's gathering with God's people around the table and fellowshipping deeply with Jesus Christ and with his people. It's what Jesus did on the cross that we commemorate in communion that centers us. It pulls us back to the presence of Christ. It reminds us of the incarnation and it makes his presence real to us again and again. So today we're going to share in communion, and for that I am grateful. Um, as we share in the elements, we want to remember that this table is the Lord's table. It's not VCL's table. It belongs to Jesus, and he invites any of us who belong to him, who have put our faith in him, to come and to share and to remember. And to remember, memories are a wonderful thing. Memories are taking what happened in the past and bringing it to the present. That's what we do when we remember. That's why we can still get emotional when we remember. Because we're taking what happened back there and we're bringing it right here to today. In the communion table, we're here to remember. Remember what Jesus did on the cross. Remember his sacrifice. 
remember his deep, deep love that held him to the cross. And we're going to bring that right here to us today in our memories, remembering, making real what Jesus has done for us, making real his presence and his power in our lives. So this morning, as we share in the table, I want to just pray a prayer, making us ready, and then we'll serve and uh, make it available and share it together in deep fellowship around the table. Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy in our lives. Thank you for the way that you move in each of us. Thank you for the way that you've drawn us here together. Oh, what you have done. And we just give you praise and honor and glory. And now, Lord, as we gather around your table, we remember, as the Apostle Paul tells us to remember, as you, Jesus, told us to remember, we remember that you are the Son of God who came, gave of himself, humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And as you hung on that cross, Lord, and your blood was shed, it was the blood that atoned for our sin. You bore the weight of our sin. You provided for us the way of salvation. And Lord, three days later, by your resurrection, you, you secured for us the victory over sin and death. And for that, we give you praise. Lord, like those who were headed to Emmaus, when you broke the bread, they saw you. They recognized you. You made yourself known to them. We pray that as we break the bread this morning, as we share around the table, you would make yourself known to us again. Refresh us with the memory of all that you have done, the memory of who you are, make it new today and lord help us as your people to fellowship deeply to recognize that around this table we are one family we are one body we each have been called and invited to share in your deep deep grace again we pray this in jesus name amen and invite the servers to come at this time. As we prepare ourselves, uh, we're going to invite you to come to receive your elements if you take them back to your seat because we're going to participate uh, together in uh, eating the bread and drinking the cup and again in doing that we're really practicing our oneness in the Lord Jesus Christ and our fellowship together so as the music begins you may come
we practiced this for like three weeks. <laughs> Friends, the Lord has given us the greatest gift. He has given us himself. And today, as his people, we remember. And it's the center of all that we are and all that we do. And the night before Jesus went to the cross, he was with his disciples. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave thanks for the bread. And then he said to his disciples, as he says to us this morning, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper also, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said to his disciples, as he says to us today, this cup is the new covenant, the new relationship I have with you in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In proclaiming his death, we proclaim the fullness of his sacrifice. We proclaim the joy of his salvation. In proclaiming his return, we proclaim the hope that is ours every day as we long to one day live in his presence. Lord, we thank you. You are our God. You are our Savior. You are our King. We give ourselves to do what you called Peter to do a long time ago, and that is to follow you. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. While our worship team is gathering again, I want to tell you a little bit about why I chose this particular psalm. Um, as many of you who have received any correspondence from Pastor Kenny, you know that he closes his correspondence with In Christ Alone. And I thought this would be a very fitting song for us to sing to thank Kenny and Suzanne for their ministry here and to praise God for his blessings on our church. Please stand with me and sing joyfully in Christ alone.
Just let the Lord talk. Receive this benediction. It's not a prayer. It's a promise. And I leave you with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.